my name is uh, Richard E. Carey, Lieutenant General, retired U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, I'm from originally. I was born in Columbus, Ohio, uh, of the Carey family. Uh, I have uh, uh, brothers that were in the Marine Corps also, and uh, uh, I entered the services in 1945, mm -hmm. right out of high school. Mm -hmm. Uh, I entered into the V-5 program, which was an aviation uh, program, an aviation cadet program. And when the war ended, I, I, as soon as I graduated from high school, I, I enlisted. You enlisted in, to? In, in, in the V-5 program. Mm -hmm. What is V-5? Uh, you have to spell out because many will listen to your interview. Who doesn't have any idea about V-5? The V-5 is a, is a uh, program in which they sent you to two years of college. Uh, and after that, you, you, were, and you, reserve, you were in reserves during that time. And after that, you were commissioned and sent to flight training to become a naval aviator. Uh, I specifically designated that I wanted to be a marine aviator. Why? Why marine? Because of your brother? No, no, no. My brother came in after me. Oh. I wanted to be a marine because of uh, uh, the pride that the Marine Corps has, and I felt that the Marine Corps was the the, the, the elite service of the United States. Got it. And I still think that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, they discontinued the program, the government discontinued the program in uh, November and said that, that uh, I would uh, have to decide to either go into the ROTC or to take a discharge. I took a discharge and enlisted in the Marine Corps, went in as an enlisted man. What year was that? 1946. Six. Now, because it took them about three months to get my papers through and everything, and to, to, to get me discharged. So then I was discharged, enlisted in the Marine Corps, went to Paris Island. Uh, after Paris Island, I went aboard ship, became a seagoing Marine, aboard the USS Boxer, uh, and spent uh, two years there. In 1948, I was selected uh, to go to Meritor as a meritorious NCO to be commissioned to second lieutenant. Huh? Uh, that was in September 1948. I started the uh, basic school at Quantico uh, and spent uh, about nine months going through school there. And after that, was transferred to the second Marine Division as a rifle, rifle, as an 0302, which is a rifle platoon mm -hmm. uh, commander. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, I served there in that in the uh, first battalion, six. Well, I was in the fourth Marines first, and then the six Marines, uh, and made a Mediterranean cruise. Mm -hmm. And when I got back from Mediterranean cruise, I had decided that. I was going to try to transfer to the reserves. I was a regular officer. Try to transfer to the reserves uh, in order to go to medical school at Ohio State University. I'd already already uh, uh, corresponded with medical school was with Ohio State University was accepted and planned to go there. My my detachment commander called me in and said, uh, "You ought to be an officer." And he reasoned with me the reason I should become an officer. Mm -hmm. What is that? Because of the, the Soviet Union and the way things were going at that time. What year was that? That was in 1948. Wow. So uh, anyway, I, I accepted the commission and, and uh, I had the two years to do that I could go into the reserves. So I was on my way up to the battalion headquarters to submit my letter of uh, to 
not retirement, but transfer to the reserves, discharge from the regular and transfer to the reserves. And a friend of mine said, hey, Kerry, do you know what just happened? And I said, no. And he said, the North Koreans have crossed the 38th parallel and invaded South Korea. We're going to war. And so I tore up my papers <laughs> right there and threw them in a wastebasket and uh, got ready. I was selected to take one of two trains, mine was a major train, to Camp Pendleton, which had all the division equipment on it. What state is the Camp Pendleton? Pardon? What state? Camp Pendleton. This was in North, no, this was, I was transferred from North Carolina to Camp Pendleton. Okay. So I took a train mm -hmm. from uh, North Carolina to Camp Pendleton. It took us seven days to do it. Yeah. Went, went all the way down south to Florida, all the way north to Ohio, then back down up to the Transcontinental Railroad and across to Camp Pendleton. When I got to Camp Pendleton, I called the number that they gave me. I had my rifle platoon. When we had my rifle platoon, mm -hmm. they gave me enough money to buy food on the way because it was a it was a uh, freight train uh, and instructions on how to pick up anybody that interfered with the train. I picked up a couple of, of people in uh, oh guys Oklahoma, not Oklahoma City, uh, in Arkansas. What's the Little Rock. Little Rock. At Little Rock, I picked up a couple guys there and turned them over to the FBI. Went on to Camp Pendleton, called, made a telephone call when I got there and said, I've got your train. Mm -hmm. And they said, you have to take it to San Diego and un unload it. So I took it down to San Diego and unloaded the train with, with my rifle platoon and then went up to Camp Pendleton. At Camp Pendleton, they took my rifle platoon and took uh, uh, a squad and a half from my rifle platoon and gave me a squad and a half of reserves, which was a, a good thing. Because in my rifle platoon, I had no combat experience. The reserves that I got, I got two squad leaders, both of whom had been in World War II, mm -hmm. which I was very lucky. There. Yeah, yeah. Very lucky. So um, we trained at Camp Pendleton. Uh, then I went down to load the ship. They sent my platoon down again to load the equipment onto the transport ship that took us to to Japan. Hold on. Did you know anything about Korea before you heard about North Korea across the Korean no. area? No, I knew nothing about Korea. You didn't learn anything from history? I knew I knew where it was. Mm -hmm. I knew that in uh, World War II it was uh, held by the Japanese. Yeah. Uh, I knew that, that what had happened as far as the 38th parallel, how the, the Soviets had moved in and, and gone as far as the 38th parallel and the Americans were as far as the 38th parallel. So what was your feeling that you have to go somewhere that you never heard of before and fight, may lose the, may well, lose your life? Uh, it was, I'm a Marine, and and uh, we were told, we were told, I knew that, that uh, South Korea was free and North Korea was com communist dominated, and we were, uh, interested in the Soviet uh, confrontation at that time. We didn't know when that was going to happen. So to me, it was a matter of fighting for a, a country that was our allies, mm. that was, was committed to uh, democratic principles. So I felt, uh, basically, I felt the same way that I would feel if I were fighting for the United States, fighting for, for freedom for people that wanted freedom. Mm -hmm. so that, Do you recall when did you actually uh, took the ship and leave, left for Japan? That when was we left for Japan... Uh, that should be 1950, right? Yeah, that's 1950. That was in... Uh, 
August, late August of 1950. Mm -hmm. So, where did you go in, in Japan? We went to uh, Camp Otsu, uh, which is outside of Kobe. Kobe, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, well, at Camp O2, we trained very hard for, uh, we, we arrived there, well, it was earlier than late August, because probably about the middle of August when we left, because it took us uh, seven days to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. And I got to Japan and we had approximately two weeks of training there. Yeah. Uh, the last week that we were there, I was again called into the battalion and told that I was going to take my platoon down and load the ships for the Incheon landing. And that is where I first met Chesty Poehler. What's that? Chesty Poehler was the uh, regimental commander of the 1st Marines. And I was loading the ship. Uh, when you load a ship for, for, a, for an invasion, you load it according to how the equipment comes off. The tanks, <laughs> the, the artillery, the trucks, and so From on. From LST, right? Well, this was, a, this was a transport ship. When you were in Japan and when you received the two weeks intensive training, you, did you know that you were going to land in Incheon? Yes. Oh. Yes, we knew. And, uh, uh, we knew, we were told about the, uh, the fight down south. Tell me about it. What at was the, the... At the perimeter? At the, Busan, Nakdong perimeter. No, the, the Pusan perimeter. Pusan we perimeter, that. yes. We, we were receiving information, briefings on that all the time on how it was going. We knew it was very difficult and it was, uh, and Korea was, uh, uh, somewhat mountainous. That, uh, so we did a lot of physical training, a lot of marches. We, we trained 18 hours a day, at least. At least 18 hours a day. And uh, night marches and everything else. So we were uh, trying to prepare physically. Although, uh, when we first went to Pendleton, we trained there too. We did a lot of physical training there. Mm -hmm. and a lot of briefing. So um, um, I was loading the ship down on my hands and knees, putting these little templates on the the uh, plan of the ship on the decks of the ship. And a individual, somebody came up to me and touched me on the shoulder, and I said, "Just a minute, I'm busy." He touched me again. I said, I'll be right with you. This time, he knocked me over. And I looked up and it was Colonel Poehler, Chesty Poehler. And I hopped, jumped up and stood at attention and saluted him and said, yes, sir, what can I do for you? He says, what the hell are you doing, Lieutenant? I said, sir, I'm trying to load the ship. And he said, well, if you throw away the paper dolls, a little, you could get it done. I said, yes, sir, mm -hmm. I'll do my best. But he was quite a character. He said that. Can you spell his name? Jesty? Jesty, C-H-E-S-T-Y, mm -hmm. P-U-L-L-E-R. He's a famous Marine, most decorated Marine of all time. Mm -hmm. He had, uh, what? Five, five Navy Crosses and yes, seven sir. Purple Hearts. Wow. So he never had the Medal of Honor, but he had uh, the second one. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of them. Uh, that was my first encounter with him. Well, we loaded the ship. And we got the ships loaded and we took off from there. Uh, my, my rifle company was aboard an LST. And on the side of the LST, we had pontoon, part of a pontoon bridge which put us kind of out of balance. And the significance of that was that on the way, we hit a typhoon. We had a typhoon that delayed us. From Japan to Korea? From Japan to Korea. Huh, in September, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we had, had one of those. And, uh, 
and uh, I, I, I prided myself in that, that, that I was one of the few people on the ship that did not get sick, seasick, mm -hmm. because of the pontoon. The pontoon we had on the side of the ship really, we really did a lot of rolling. So if there were no typhoon, then Incheon landing might happen in around earlier than September 15th. Is that right? That's right. So I spent my time up at the up on the bridge with the the captain, and I was only the second lieutenant. The, the, our company commander was sick. Everybody else was sick except me, and the captain. He didn't get sick. Mm -hmm. So uh, we made uh, made the landing on September the fifteenth. Now I I landed on Blue Beach. Blue Beach, yes. Red Beach is uh, down from Walmy Do. Yeah. Uh, and we landed at night uh, in the evening at the at the high tide right if you if you recall from the landing i know you've got this from the briefings and you know it that you had the high tide in the morning and then the high tide in the evening yeah we couldn't land until 5:30 i see my objective i was given a special objective my platoon of radio hill mm -hmm which was behind Blue Beach, uh, probably a thousand yards, fifteen hundred yards. Maybe but there was a landing before you landed, right? Early in the morning, right? In the morning, when there was high the, tide. The fifth Marines landed at Walmy Do on Red Beach, mm -hmm. and they took Walmy Do mm -hmm. and were holding that. Yeah, because it commanded. They had to hold. Walmy Do because it commanded the entire beach. And they had seawall all along there. There was a break in the seawall. And my LVT guy got disoriented and took us into a creek area where there was a creek, a break in the seawall where a little little uh, inlet where mm -hmm. the creek came out. Yeah, yeah. And when he went up that and on both sides of the creek were barbed wire. Oh. So the, the, the enemy knew that we were would probably come in that way. Yes. And they prepared it with barbed wire. So we, we disembarked from the LVTs and we're cutting the barbed wire when and I had a 536 on my shoulder and a sniper shot the 536 off. That was my 536 radio. Uh -huh. So I had no radio. But you, 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 you were not killed. I was not killed because of that. Because he, he shot there, and then his next round hit the guy right next to me, right through the forehead. My sniper, uh, Peepside, uh, was his name, Peepside Tendis. Fired back him. He he is he just just died this last year. But he, he saw where the sniper was from and he took him out. Good. So we went, we went uh, got through the wire and we came to a, a road. It was down in the factory area at, uh, at uh, uh, Incheon. Incheon. And, and uh, that's, that's where they had, to, they had a, a tower where the sniper was. He was up in the tower. Uh, we came to a road. Before going to that. Was there severe resistance when you land? What? What? Severe resistance from North Korean soldiers. Oh yeah, yeah, not a lot where we were. Describe it. Yeah, this the snipers uh, until we got to this road. Then we got to this road, and then they had it zeroed in with machine guns. Machine guns. So now we hit. Now we hit uh, some some uh, resistance. And Lots of casualties too. Uh, I I had not I had about three wounded is about all and one killed a kid by the name of Murphy who was who was kind of kind of a uh, not a very good marine and he started to cross and I yelled at him I said Murph get down we got machine guns I got up to uh, uh, we we took took out our resistance there. It was, it was sporadic. A few riflemen, not many riflemen, and machine guns down at the end. We got those out. 
So then we took off and right there was Radio Hill. So we went up Radio Hill and when we got up on Radio Hill, uh, I put them in a defensive uh, perimeter and we got shelled right there by an Army LVT that had 75 millimeter shell and he shelled us. So I had had a had I had to send a runner down to try to find the company commander who had a radio and said we're getting shelled and I had about four guys hit on that no, no kill but I had four guys killed to um, hit we got that stopped we held for that night and the next morning I was I was uh, sent by the battalion with my platoon off Radio Hill, a unit replaced us on Radio Hill, and I was sent to go on a re uh, reconnaissance uh, up up the, the main road to Seoul. Seoul. Yes. Um, we took off down this down this uh, road, and it became a trail uh, very quickly. It was not much of a road. And we took off down that, and there we hit. Uh, a North Vietnamese or North Korean platoon. They took us under fire. So I uh, got my squad leaders together. They were on kind of a, a rise. Got my squad leaders together and told them how we we're going to take them out. So I put, let my platoon sergeant stay behind with the base of fire. I took a, a squad on an envelopment around the, the flank of where the enemy was and there I came upon the lieutenant or the officer in charge of the of the North Koreans and I had my pistol out and he raised his hands and it uh, triggered me and I pulled the trigger. Oh. <laughs> And when I pulled the trigger, I shot his his pistol belt off, and he fell to the ground. And I felt I felt pretty regretful. I thought I'd killed him uh -huh. because he was trying to surrender. But it was just a reaction. I just pulled the trigger on it. So anyway, uh, that was uh, I. They, he surrendered his platoon, and uh, I later received a, a bronze star for that because I took a whole platoon prisoner. Did you sense that North Koreans knew about Incheon Landing? Did you see many presence of North Korean... Um... They were not, they were not really, the Incheon Landing was not that violent, uh, except at Walmado. They mm -hmm. did have, they had, because they commanded the beach there, uh, but they weren't there in real strong military force mm. at Incheon. But how about on the way to Seoul? Did you see many presence of North Korean force? Uh, I did because my platoon was in the lead of the tanks. Yeah, reconnaissance, right. It put me on the lead, lead platoon, mm -hmm. lead, lead tanks. And I had a little, a little, I'll tell you a little story there. Uh, we were moving out on the tanks and uh, we, we had a, a momentary stop and I looked out to the left and right out of this hut was the muzzle of a T-34. Oh. So I very quickly, very quickly opened the hatch to the tank and told the tank commander and he swung his, his turret around and took out that T-34. Mm -hmm. They apparently, they didn't, apparently didn't weren't going to react for some reason or other. But we took out that T-34, then we started down the road and we got about, oh, maybe another three or four hundred yards and this motorcycle came around the corner with a North Korean officer in the sidecar. And my platoon opened up on him immediately and that was the end of him. He ran into the ditch. We went another 
three or four hundred yards, and we came to a a ambush, a road. They had set up a defensive position on the road. The North Koreans had. Mm -hmm. So I disembarked and again was briefing my platoon leaders, I mean my squad leaders, on how we were going to take out this this roadblock. When up the road, my platoon sergeant tapped me on the shoulder and said, Lieutenant, look what's coming up the road. Want to guess who it was? Douglas MacArthur. Oh. He's coming up the road. So you paved the way for him. Yeah. And he was coming up just, I don't know why he was there, what he was doing, but he was walking right up to the very front lines because I was on the lead tank. Did you take the picture? <laughs> no, I did a little different thing. Than what did you do? He was, he was walking up the middle of the road, bullets were flying. I ran out to where he was and pulled him in, and in the process he fell down. Really? He fell down into the, into the dirt. Now, he had on khakis, yeah. his peak cap, his sunglasses, his pipe. Yeah. And he said, what do you think you're doing, Lieutenant? And I said, sir, we're in a firefight and I'm trying to keep you from getting killed. You know what he said to me? God is my witness. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant, the bullet isn't made that can kill me. That's a fact. And that's in a book. Yep. You ever read Pat O'Donnell's book? No, uh, no I didn't. But I think uh, I know Give that. Me Tomorrow? It's about my rifle company. Mm. But it, uh, it's, a, it's a good book. It's a good book. But, but uh, anyway, that was the story of Douglas MacArthur until we got, well, uh, we got to Yongdong Po. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we had a pretty good fight there. That's where they, they finally really started fighting us heavy. We had a pretty good fight. My platoon advanced across some uh, open rice paddies. And there was a, a uh, hut at the end that they were, that the North Koreans were uh, pretty heavy in. And we, we had to fight our way to that. We flanked them again and took the hut. And that night <coughs> we spent uh, there was a road, uh, I don't know where it was to, but it was in the middle of the Yongdong Po. And the North Koreans were on one side of the road, mm -hmm. and we were on the other side of the road. And we tossed grenades back and forth, and we ran out of grenades, and we took, uh, we took uh, uh, C2 uh, explosives, mm -hmm. and uh, we found a, we found a, a factory with a whole bunch of equipment and we put nails around the, around the explosives and that's what we threw as grenades yeah. when we ran out. But we had uh, an all-night fight and then by the next morning they were, most of them were killed or had bugged right. out. Mm -hmm. They bugged out. So then we went on and we wound up uh, uh, to the Han River. And I, my platoon was on a, a hill overlooking the Han, and I remember we 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 could hear uh, the battleships uh, gunfire. They sound like a freight train coming. Mm -hmm. They were they were uh, shelling Seoul. Um, what was the first thing you remember about Seoul when you entered in? Uh, we went up Mapu Boulevard. Mapo. Uh, Mapo. Yeah. You know, are you familiar with that? Yeah, one? yeah. But before we got there, there was a there was a school on the left where we where we finally where we stopped momentarily, and that's where one of my we, we stopped and we were taking a breather. And uh, 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 
Sergeant Lilly, who was a World War II vet, one of the squad leaders that I got. Yeah, yeah. you about. said that you were lucky to have him. Well, I, I, I missed one thing. In Yongdong Po, I lost one of my squad leaders, oh. Benaxis, who was also a World War II vet. He was trying, he was in the process of uh, sur taking surrender from uh, prisoners from that were surrendering to our platoon, North Koreans, mm -hmm. and one of them shot him in the heart in the process of surrendering. Uh, but at, in Seoul, when we stopped, uh, the main thing that I remember about that morning, that's, this was the 25th of September. The main thing I remember about that morning was Willie was sitting, he and I were sitting there, and a, a bullet hit right between us. And I said, Sarge, I think we better get up and move. Mm -hmm. So we started to get up, and he took one right through the heart. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh my God, that's all he said. Um, I was on the main boulevard, Mapo, Mop and the other two platoons of the company were on a hillside that was right there. There was a school there, and I can't remember the name of the school. There was a school there, and uh, my the other two platoons were were uh, there were North Koreans on the other side of the school, and they were flanking. We were holding, and they were flanking to take on the North Koreans. And I walked up uh, to, to go to see what they were doing. And uh, I ran into a North Korean. Mm. Um, I ran into it, and I went on, okay? Um, I went up the hill, and there, uh, one of my, the, the uh, platoon sergeant of the of the third platoon, had been badly wounded, and they were in a they were in a pretty good firefight. So I was still holding on the on the main on Mapo, yeah. and uh, I picked up the platoon sergeant and carried him back to the aid station. In the process, I got pretty badly covered with blood, which I, never, which I didn't get off of me until the 12th of October. I remember that, I didn't get it. We didn't, I didn't have an opportunity to clean up until they pulled us off the front lines to go around to Wonsan. But I, I, I came back and that night we had a hellacious fight, the night of the 25th. They came down to you mean September Mapo, 25th? Pardon? September 25th. Yeah. They came down Mapo Boulevard with tanks, and our tanks were there. And I was, I was standing beside one of the tanks, our tank, and he fired. I was standing, he, he came right up beside me, and his, his 95 was right there, and he let go with a round. And it knocked me down and over the side of a bridge. It was a bridge right there, and broke my eardrum. I still have trouble with hearing out of that ear. Mm. But uh, we we uh, we knocked out four tanks that night, three or four tanks, North Korean tanks on the, on the main main street. Um, Next day we proceeded on, and there I ran into MacArthur again. It was a, uh, he was going over to see President Reed mm. to turn Seoul over to him. And I had a, a security place that before the, the palace. And MacArthur stopped a car, he apparently recognized me, because huh. he called me over to the car. He was riding in a, a sedan. He called me over and said, uh, how's it going, Lieutenant? I said, better than it was, General, better than it was. He says, well, carry on, continue on with your work. 
Wow. He's a, he's a pretty good guy from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, we went back into, we went back into uh, reserve, our battalion did, at that time, and spent a couple days there, and that's, I met uh, Maggie Higgins. You heard of Marguerite Higgins? No. She wrote the book, uh, This is War. It was a pictorial uh, monograph of, of, of the battle for Seoul up to that time and then Seoul. Pretty good, but I met her there. Uh, not much to say about that. But we, we then continued on north, uh, crossing the uh, 38th parallel, we consider, consider, uh, continued up to, I forget the name of the town now, but there we, um, we were stopped and informed that we would be pulling back and be relieved by the 1st Cavalry Division. So they loaded us onto trucks to take us back to Incheon. And on the way back, I'll give you a little story there that's kind of interesting. <laughs> funny, really funny. <laughs> but we were, we were pretty grimy. Like I say, I had my utilities on. I was covered with blood. And we hadn't shaved or anything. Uh, we brushed our teeth when we could, but we, we didn't have time to really clean up. And uh, they had to, my whole platoon was loaded on two six buys. Uh, we came back to the Han River and they had a pontoon bridge across the Han River. And they had these uh, boats, little boats beside it with uh, security boats, I guess they were termed, with uh, uh, soldiers in each one. And one of the soldiers we stopped, we were stopped uh, temporarily on the bridge, and one of the soldiers said, uh, ah, here comes the raggedy ass Marines, excuse me for the language, here comes the raggedy ass Marines. One of my guys had a grenade and he threw it into the boat, did pull the pin, but it panicked the soldier and he leaped over the side. <laughs> and our, this guy said, Here's to your raggedy ass marine. <laughs> Our company was on a. We, we were taken back, and the first thing they did is they, they cleaned us up. They gave us uh, new utilities and gave us a shower, let us shower and so on. And made certain we shaved because uh, the battalion surgeon said if you get hit in the face with a beard, you're going to be badly, badly scarred. We uh, did that, and I was designated again. I had all the crap details, it seemed <laughs> like, my platoon. But I was designated again to get supplies for our LST, because we were going to vote on an LST to sail around to Wonsan. Uh, and the only supplies that the Army gave us, the 10th Corps gave us, was corned beef hash and cherries in these big cans. That's it? That was it. And we don't, didn't know how long we were going to be there. So it just so happened that the, that the uh, uh, the ship that we were on was the ship that we rode over to Incheon, the LST. So, so I went to them. You, you had to return to the Incheon, right? The Incheon. Okay. We loaded out there to go to, to uh, one Wonsan. Uh -huh. yeah, and the, the uh, LST commander, I talked to him and I said, Skipper, I need, I need your help. He said, what's wrong? And I told him about the supplies we had. Well, he gave me all kinds of supplies. He gave me eggs, steaks, hamburgers, flour, sugar, wow. everything. So, like I say, we're on a Japanese LST, and when I went down into the bilges to, to look at, the, at what they had, there was a great big dead fish hanging there, and that was it. <laughs> or 
remember that quite well. But, but uh, we, that's where we put all of our frozen food and so mm -hmm. on. So we landed. Uh, we we uh, sailed for Wonsan, and we wound up uh, uh, run, just circling out there because the North Koreans had mined the harbor where we were supposed to make our landing. So we we uh, on the last day we ran out of supplies. I remember that. And I was down in the uh, down in the galley. We had uh, uh, pancakes, and I was down there flipping pancakes for the troops on the, on the last morning before we landed. And we landed at uh, Wonsan. Uh, and the, the funny thing about it was, the South Koreans had advanced as far as yeah. Wonsan, and had taken Wonsan, and Bob Hope was there. Ah. With his troop, and here we were making an amphibious landing, and and the USO was having having Bob Hope have a show for for those troops that were already there. Ah. Uh, but uh, anyway, that was the story of landing at Wonsan. Now we were we were loaded up. Uh, well, before we were loaded up, uh, one of our my guys went out and. And got a deer. Shot a deer, so we had a we had deer meat. A, we had a little meat there on the, <laughs> on the beach. But uh, we loaded up, and I was designated. My platoon again was designated to take a bulldozer out to Majini, which was where we were going. Mm -hmm. So we took the bulldozer. Over the road, you know that takes a long time yeah. running the bulldozer yeah, that yeah, far. Yeah. I forget how far Majini was. Something like 20 miles. Was it that far? I think more than 20 miles. Yeah, because I took a couple patrols back into Wonsan, and our second platoon leader, uh, Jim Beeler, who had was a Naval Academy graduate, uh, was a second-string All-American football player. Uh, took one of the patrols, later took one of the patrols, and was killed on that patrol. He had gotten a Purple Heart uh, earlier, and the North Koreans, uh, we had to go out and rescue the column, and we found him with a Purple Heart stuck in his mouth. They stuck the Purple Heart in his mouth. Could you tell the audience about Purpose of one sun landing and you know geographical location. Incheon is west, one sun is in the east, northeast, right? What's that? The one sun, the location is a north east, east, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, could you explain? Well up into North, North Korea, yeah. So, please explain what is the goal of one sun landing at the time. Well, the goal of the one sun landing was to cut off all the any North Koreans that were in the interior because we, our, our uh, battalion was directed to go to fight the way west. Pyongyang. Uh, all the way west, yeah. yes. And we wound up at Majini. Uh -huh. uh, and they stopped us at Majini and we put, did a lot of patrolling and so on. We captured quite a few North Koreans mm -hmm. in our patrols. So we went on patrols for Oh gosh, uh, let's see, we landed somewhere around the 20, 20 something of October, and we went on patrols for almost up till Thanksgiving mm -hmm. in November, and we were pulled back and sent up to back to Wonsan to load on the trains to go north. So, uh, yeah, Wonsan was. Uh, Majini, again, we, we had to go into, into uh, Wonsan for, for supplies for the battalion. So that's where the patrols went. We, we were actually, actually just covering, uh, covering uh, uh, trucks to, to carry supplies back. But they, and I took, I had guys three or four of those patrols. And when Jim Beeler went, that was the one where they, they got hit. 
Uh, and so I was still lucky. Yeah. Still lucky. Uh, when we got back to Wonsan to load up just before Thanksgiving, that's when I saw Chesty Puller again. Again. And we were we were in a, 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 a bivouac area, getting ready for Thanksgiving dinner, and they had a a um, they had a uh, formation battalion formation in which we were giving out metal, and I was in the, now getting the the bronze star for the the capture of the, the North Korean platoon. And uh, Chesty Poor came up to me and recognized me, I guess, from the times we'd been together, and he said, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> and I said, I don't know, Colonel, I'm just getting, it. I guess I'm just getting recognized for, but Chesty was a guy that he, loved his troops. He was not a, he, he, officers were not his favorites. He was a, he was like me, he was a Mustang. Uh -huh. And he, he, he uh, favored the enlisted guys. So I guess that's, I was the only officer in the formation, so I guess that's why he, he said that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, anyway, we had, we, uh, uh, went back to Wonsan on Thanksgiving. We had a good meal. Uh, when was that? Early October? November. Is it November already? Yeah. Well, you got wounded on the 9th, didn't you, November? Huh? Didn't you get wounded early November? Uh, 29th of... 29th of... Of October? Of November. Of November. That okay. was up at the reservoir. So you knew that the Chinese already crossed the Yaru River at the time. Did you know? We had reports that the Seventh Marines had been in a fight with the Chinese. With the Chinese. Uh, this was in uh, early November that they had had this fight. Mm -hmm. So, about, well, not early, but about mid-November, about 15th or yeah. so, I think. 13th, I think it was. I think that was the date. I'm trying to recall. I think it was the 13th. But uh, at that time, I was relieved of my uh, rifle platoon and, and uh, told that I was going to be the S2 of the battalion. I didn't like that. Didn't want to do that, but nevertheless, the battalion commander said that's your job. So. Mm -hmm. And my first mission was to go north to up to Coterie. Coterie, yeah. Uh, and I took a jeep and a driver and drove up there. Um, went right through. Uh, there were Chinese all over the place. They never bothered me. Hmm. And I went, went, went all the way up to Coterie and met with the, with the, the uh, S2 of uh, the 7th Marines and the 5th Marines were on up on the other side of the reservoir at that time. Yeah. So um, uh, I drove back and the next day we went up to, we launched up to uh, uh, Hagaru. I went all the way to Hagaru then. Mm. How was the situation at the time? Uh, it was pretty quiet right at that time. Uh, the 5th Marines, this was, this was, uh, see this is right at, right at the end of November, toward the end of November. Mm -hmm. And I, as I recall, Thanksgiving was either on the 21st or the 23rd. Yeah, that should be. You, you said that you had a Thanksgiving in Wonsan in early November. No, it's not. I didn't mean early November. I right, meant, right. I meant Thanksgiving, as I said, was about 21st. Exactly. So I was wondering. Okay. Oh. But right the day after Thanksgiving is when I went to Hagaru. Got it. 
Okay. And then came back. Then the next day we went up. As soon as I briefed the battalion commander what was going on there, then we went up. We loaded uh, on trucks and, and, and drove up to uh, Agaroo. Uh -huh. No problem. Uh -huh. um, when I got to Hagaru, I met with the with the uh, two the intelligence officer of the division. Talked to him, and he said, "We're going to give you uh, some." Uh, Katusa intelligence agents. So you're talking about Katusa, two Katusa. Katusa. Now this is about the 24th. A couple days have elapsed. We only have two companies there, plus some some uh, division. Mm -hmm. people, not full units, just uh, really, really kind of skeleton crews of everything. Mm -hmm. We did have a, a, a battery of artillery and we had a, a platoon of tanks. Um, the, the, we set up a perimeter and it was kind of a makeshift perimeter, very much a makeshift perimeter. Uh, we had two companies down in the rice paddies and headquarters units up on East Hill, which was a mistake. That wasn't my doing. Mm. That was a mistake. Should have been the other way around. Yeah. And, and uh, what happened is, the Chinese came in on East Hill, and they were overlooking Hangaroo. Mm. But I took these Korean uh, Katusas who had who had uh, uh, been in the Chinese army. Oh, really? Yeah. So they they knew mm. how to get along. Mm. So I sent them out. And I said, you find out for me what the Chinese are doing, where they are, and what they're doing. But they came back to me and on the night of the 28th is when the Chinese really hit Agaru. Mm. The Katusas had told me where they were going to hit, and they didn't concentrate on East Hill. Surprisingly, mm. they concentrated on the rice paddies. They wanted to come directly into Hagaru and take it because, you know, the location of Hagaru. And the, at, at that time, there was one MSR main supply route from Ham Hung up to up to Chin Hung Ni, mm. and then the the single road, single single lane mountain road up to Hagaru, Kotori and Hagaru. And there it branched off around the reservoir, east east going mm -hmm. one way and west going the other way. Uh, they wanted Hagaru because if they got that, everybody out here was lost. Okay. Exactly. So they wanted to get into Hagaru itself. So they planned to come across the rice paddies. Mm -hmm. Well, they told me the Katusas gave me enough information that I knew by movement, being a grunt, a former grunt, I knew how long it was going to take them to go, and I predicted, I said, You're going to have, we're going to have our, the main attack is going to be here at 9.30 at night. And, and at, at uh, no, 10.30, because I, I made one statement afterwards. Anyway, it was that, that particular time, so we were ready. Our company commanders really had a, a, a reception for them. Hmm. They had put they had put uh, uh, expeditionary cans uh, on the on the field, 
and to the expeditionary cans that they, they strapped a, a, a white phosphorus grenade so that when the Chinese attacked, they would pull the, pull the pin on the, the, with a the wire on the white phosphorus grenade and it would it'd have a, a napalm right there. So you were ready to party. They were ready to fight. They were <laughs> really ready for them. And, and it was very profitable from the standpoint of they, they broke through one place. And I was sent with a makeshift company out to close that gap that night, that the night of the 28th. Uh, they, they, I was the, the grunt in the battalion headquarters, so they, they got me and said, you take them, Gary, and close the gap. Uh, and that's where I, I didn't actually get wounded. I got, I got uh, knocked unconscious by, uh, I, when I closed the gap at Howe Company, that's where the, the Chinese broke through. Close the gap there. Then I went over to I Company to see what they're doing. And, and as I crossed the airstrip, and they were building the airstrip now. Mm -hmm. This is important, the most important part of the battle that, that we're talking about here. Why is it spent this? Because that's where our supplies came in and our wounded went out. Mm -hmm. And if, if O.P. Smith hadn't done that, we'd have been in a Bad, bad fight. Mm -hmm. Been in really bad trouble. But he had the foresight, and that's where he he countered. Almond came in and said, "What are you building an airstrip for? You're supposed to be in the attack." And he said, "We've got to have a capability to get supplies and evacuate our wounded. And that saved us, really. That plus air, mm -hmm. air saved us because." The Chinese could only fight at night because of our air. Mm -hmm. They couldn't. They couldn't attack during yeah. the daytime. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I took a took a, a, a uh, I, I took off across the airstrip, and there I ran into a Chinese soldier who was on the airstrip. Our engineers. Now it's nighttime. It's snowing. And very cold. Very cold, and the Chinese have already broken through. And they're mingling around. The engineers are still on their bulldozers and their equipment building the airstrip. They never, they never left their, their equipment. Mm. I ran into a Chinese soldier there, another, another incident. This time he got away because he ran and I didn't want to shoot him in the back. Moved into I Company, and just before I got to I Company, a Chinese uh, let go with a burp gun on the edge side of this building, and it knocked off a bunch of whatever the building was made of, concrete, and hit me in the middle of the back and knocked me down and unconscious, mm. knocked me out. And they came out and picked me up and took me over to the CP and said. Well, there's no blood. Well, there was blood, but they didn't see it. But I, I, that, that didn't mean anything at that time. One of my best friends was uh, killed there, a guy by the name of uh, Charlie Maddox. Charlie had, uh, Charlie was a, a, a former uh, master sergeant, uh, was in my basic school class and a good friend, and I went over to see him. And I walked away from him in a, in a mortar round, went in his, in his foxhole with him, and killed him right there. Uh, that was the night of the 28th. Mm -hmm. Very important night yeah. for the holding of Hagaru. Um, the prediction that we had there at Hagaru, they credit that with saving Hagaru because the rifle companies were, yeah, were yeah. well prepared. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the, 29th, the 29th was Hellfire Valley. You've probably heard of that. Mm -hmm. When my rifle company 
which had been held back, now came up to Hagaru. Huh. And they fought their way through with some 200 Royal Marine Commandos and a company of tanks. They came through. The rest of that uh, group of, of, uh, that was coming up Hellfire Valley uh, set up perimeters. They were cut in two. They set up perimeters and some of those were captured, ran out of ammunition, and heavy casualties were captured by the Chinese. Yeah. Uh, the next night is when uh, they got up there, the night of the 29th, morning of the 30th. Then they hit East Hill. The guy that relieved me, and I won't give you his name, but the guy that relieved me uh, took part of my old platoon off the hill, and the Chinese moved in. Uh -huh. uh, the company commander, Carl Sitter, who got the Medal of Honor on that hill, Carl Sitter uh, uh, called down to the battalion and said, I want carry. So they said, go muster what you got left of your platoon and muster all the people. Gave me a, about 75 guys mm -hmm. total. He said, take them up and help on East Hill. Mm. So I, when I got up there, I, the rifle platoon commander of the second platoon was uh, wounded and evacuated. So I took over two platoons on the hill that night. And I, on the way up the hill, a little vignette there, I was carrying a, we, we went, before we went, we went down to the, the airstrip and got ammunition, grenades, and I was carrying a box of grenades. And on the way up, about halfway up, East Hill was very icy and uh, steep. Mm. So it took a lot of energy to go up, and we stopped about halfway. I stopped all the guys about halfway and said, take a break and we'll move on from here. And a bullet hit, the, I was sitting, and a bullet hit right on the grenade box. And I got up, and before I went, I didn't have a park, I had a field jacket. Uh -huh. The battalion commander of the Royal Marine Commandos had been wounded in the arm and shoulder, and he said, take my parka. So I took his parka. And when I stopped on the way up the hill, and the bullet hit between my hands, I stood up, and a bullet hit me right here. Hmm. Now, what happened is, I had on a cartridge belt, and I don't know why, but the bullet went around and went out the back. So when I when I gave him back his parka the next day, it's Drysdale, right? Huh? Drysdale. Drysdale. Colonel Drysdale. There's a bullet hole here, a bullet hole back here, and we on a, on our our uh, DVD that we're what we're making now. He said, "Where's the blood, lad?" There's a bullet hole here and a bullet hole there, and there's no blood. Where's the blood? And I, I told him what had happened. It went around and came out the back. So that that was that night. I I don't think I get it. You don't get it? I don't. And I stood up. He took. Okay. I stood up like this. Like bullet hit here. Went around here, came out the back. How? How? Don't tell. It, don't ask me. It's a spam pound. It hit the, hit the resistance. It just went, probably hit him at an angle and just falling around the, the cartridge belt. That's a true story. Can you believe I'm sorry, it? Sorry, no. <laughs> oh, that's people, a miracle. You heard of people getting hit in the head with a bullet, and the bullet goes around. Well, when I went out, skull. when I went out to. Company, 
the exec, the, the, battalion, the company commander had been wounded, the exec had the company, and he had taken a bullet right here uh -huh. in the helmet and went around the helmet and came out the back. He couldn't hear. I tried to talk to him and he couldn't hear because of the noise. Oh, amazing. It happens. Believe me, it happens. Yeah. It's one of those freaks of, of combat. Yeah. Low velocity rounds of those bird guns. Wow. Uh, on the way out, uh, well, anyway, you, you, you know the history of, of uh, the Chosen Reservoir. Changjin Battle, yes. You know the Changjin Battle. Uh, that, that uh, we left, well, I, I went out with my, uh, with my section. Uh, we fought our way down the road to Coterie. At Coterie, you know about the star of Coterie? No. You don't know about no, that? No. It's in my brochure and it's on my DVD, but we ran out of ammunition. Uh, you know about Tootsie Rolls? Yeah. Okay. Well, that the night before, we were to go from Coterie mm -hmm. down to Chin Hung Ni. Mm -hmm. They had to cross the Funchalon Pass, and at the Funchalon Pass, the bridge had been blown at the at the power plant there, mm -hmm. and a, a, a railroad over, overpass had been blown, which covered the road. So they had to drop a bridge, Treadway Bridge, mm -hmm. and they dropped it the night before. But the weather was so bad, the only way they could drop it is they had to do it visually. The weather was so bad that they, they didn't have, and we had to have air cover the next day too. What happened is everybody said their prayers. And that night the sky opened up and it was one star. That's the star of Coda Reef. Uh -huh. And they, we knew from that, that was our message that we were going to make it out, it was going to clear up, and we were going to get out. And it did. It's right here. That's, oh yeah. Ah, can that's you, that can you close up? That's the star of Coda Reef. Are you, do you believe in God? Uh, absolutely. Did you? Well, I have. Time, I've told you a couple. I've told you a couple incidents so far. Now, if I if I didn't believe in in God, uh, I wouldn't have told you those in that way. Were you Christian at the time? Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you saw that star in the sky of Kodori. That's how they're able to drop the bridge. Now that's why, that's why on our monument we have a, the top of the monument. Have they got, have they got it there? Yeah. Just show them that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got an Englishman? Huh? You got an Englishman? Oh yeah, here I had a whole bunch of them. Give an English one too.